Welcome to another OptaPlanner example. This time we'll be looking at investment portfolio optimization. Uh, this is a form of financial optimization. So um, in this case, we are going to um, the, the stock market or, and uh, the other markets out there um, in, uh, in the financial setting, of course, and we are going to buy uh, certain assets. So for example, we'll be buying stocks from Red Hat and Google and Oracle, as you can see here, uh, or uh, other companies like Tesla, Ford, and so forth. And um, which is very typical in financial optimization, uh, we'll be trying to maximize our uh, expected return. We're trying to make as much profit as possible. Um, so let's take a look at what happens here. So we have all of these uh, different asset classes. This is just one data set. And you can see that, for example, for uh, Red Hat here, we have an expected return of 13.6%. Um, and we have a standard deviation risk of 29%. This was uh, taken from quite some time ago. So uh, these numbers, of course, change every day. And this is based on historical uh, data, of course, right? Now, uh, let's take a look at what happens if we want to maximize our expected return, if we can in invest 100% of our money on, on, on these uh, different assets, and what uh, OptiPlanner will recommend us to do. Now, let's take a look what happens. We optimize this. Um, it's quite clear that it's telling us to invest 100% in Tesla Motors. Why? Uh, very simple. Tesla Motors has the highest expected return. It has 54.7% uh, return, uh, which is of course higher than everything else. So it's very clear. Uh, we should invest everything in Tesla. Uh, that's a good thing. It's a green company, but um, you might also notice there's a downside on, on investing in Tesla Motors. The downside is that there is a big risk when you invest in them because they have a risk, standard deviation risk of, of 53.9. That's very high. It basically means that although in general you'll get a lot of money back, um, there's a good chance that you will actually lose all your money. Uh, not necessarily all your money, but uh, a large portion of your money. So um, you might want to invest in, so you want to invest in other things too. Uh, more importantly, you, every one of us has a certain amount of risk they are wanting, want, uh, want to take uh, with the assets that they buy, of course, right? So uh, instead of going for standard deviation uh, maximum of 100% uh, here, let's say what happens if we go for something like, okay, I don't want to take more than 15% uh, risk basically, right? Uh, the standard deviation is a measure of risk. So uh, let's see how that happens. We solve this. And what you now see is that uh, on the bottom, you can see the expected return. It's much less now. It's only 30% instead of 54%. But you can also see that our standard deviation risk is no longer 53%, but instead it's 15%, right? So now it's telling us that we should uh, apparently buy Apple. Uh, not my favorite thing to buy, um, but we should buy 24% of them. A little bit of Google, uh, again, 10% of Tesla Motors. They are good to invest some of your money in. And uh, a large amount of Starbucks apparently in this case okay so how do we calculate so um, how do we calculate that standard deviation risk well first of all uh, this this is the input given from historical data from a number of websites you get out there and uh, then we have a formula to calculate the average standard deviation risk now you this is n this is not actually the average because you cannot just take the average on these numbers there's something else that comes into play and which is called correlation Right. So here's cor here's the correlation. So uh, let's take a look. For example, between um, the first two stocks, Red Hat and Google, there's a correlation of 0 0.05. So that means that um, when the Red Hat stock becomes more valuable, it's uh, likely that the uh, Google stock also becomes more valuable for about 5% uh, at least of what the Red Hat gained. Um, this also means that if one of them drops, that the other will likely be affected too. Um, so this is quite interesting. For example, so you can, for example, see that apparently Red Hat and Oracle are quite tied together. Uh, they have a 0.6 uh, correlation. And you can see, of course, that every, everything has with itself, every asset has with itself, or every asset class has with itself 
uh, zero correlation, of course, right? And of course, you can also have negative correlations. So for example, here's an example of a negative correlation where the Oracle and McDonald's company are, for whatever reason, uh, um, uh, they are negatively inclined. This, this means that once Oracle starts making more profit, uh, uh, when their uh, stock value increases, it's likely that McDonald's uh, will decrease with at least 1%, which is probably more than a rounding error than anything else, I think. But um, anyway, that, that's that's what the historical data is telling us. You can see sometimes they're higher, right? And uh, once we would mix in other types of assets, like for example, gold or silver, uh, you can actually see, you would actually see a higher, uh, uh, more uh, uh, correlations that are negative because uh, when the stock market crashes, then gold rises and vice versa, of course, right? So, okay, so we need to take those correlations into account. So how does do we take those into account? Well, uh, again, we, uh, OptoPlanner just uh, applies those in its calculation to calculate this total uh, standard deviation risk. So you're probably wondering what's the formula to do that. Well, this is the formula to do that. It's a very uh, heavy formula. Um, apparently it's called the Markowitz portfolio theory or something like that, whatever. Uh, as you can see, it's not a simple formula. We take in the weights um, uh, of how much we're investing in that stock. We take in, uh, of course, the, st uh, the, st the standard deviation of the stock itself, of the assets class itself. And then we also add in the correlations, which are over here. Those O, um, no, the, the R is the correlation between those uh, two assets and so forth. And we do uh, lots and lots of sums over those. And then we do, do some squaring over those. So um, this is actually a formula, which as you can easily see, that goes up to, um, here we have to the power two and to the power two. So that's to get up to the power four in terms here. And here we have terms up into the power five. Um, which is quite a heavy uh, formula, as you can imagine. Of course, this is no pro problem for OptoPlanner because it can handle basically any type of constraint, right? So um, yeah, and um, for example, if you have two assets, this is the way to calculate that formula. But if you have three assets, it becomes uh, actually heavier already. This is it. And if you have like in the example I have here, uh, 12 assets, it becomes much, much more. Um, despite that, we can actually calculate it quite quickly and with OptoPlanner we can do it even with incremental score calculation, which means that we don't recalculate the entire formula, but only incrementally the part of it which has changed when OptoPlanner starts changing things. Okay, great. Um, we now know that uh, apparently we have to invest in, in, in these combinations to maximize our return uh, and to stay below, uh, while we stay below our uh, desired risk ratio. But we might as, have extra constraint, uh, constraints. For example, um, in this case, we are investing in there are three sectors, namely the tech, the cars, and the food sector. And you can easily see that right now I would be investing 48, actually uh, more, more than 50% into the food sector because I'm investing in Starbucks and McDonald's, right? Um, so actually 56% we are currently investing in food. So let's say uh, I don't like food that much or um, um, I fear that I expect that there will be a crisis in food very soon. So I don't want to invest more than 20% in food, right? So now I've, I've changed it. As you can see, the direct result is that it tells me, okay, 65% is too much. Uh, we, uh, we can actually see the hard score breaking here. So let's see what he, what happens if we solve this. Let me just go back here and see what happens if we solve this. And you can see right now that um, as a result of this, now we are only, uh, we are buying 20% of Starbucks uh, stocks and we are buying no McDonald's corporations. So if we actually look here, we can see that the food, we are now investing only 20% of our uh, budget into the food thing. Right. Uh, similarly, really, it would be easy for uh, to add a constraint which says we want a minimum amount to invest in tech or something like that. That's all possible, of course, right? Um, and uh, sectors is just one uh, one uh, uh, one axis, right? So uh, right here you can see the sector. Uh, they're in the Starbucks sector, and we have the McDonald's uh, are also in the uh, sorry, and the, they're both in the food sector. Um, in this case, all of them are in the same region. They're all in the global region. Um, but let me load a different data set with, uh, created by uh, um, 
Satish Irinki who helped me create this example. Um, and, and you can see here in this data set that we have a number of different types of asset classes. These are real asset classes, they're not individual stocks anymore. Um, and we see that we have UK equities, which is in the region UK and which is in the sector equities. And then we have um, X UK equities, which I put in the region global and in the sector equities. Um, again, I'm not a financial expert, might be big there uh, in my data set, but um, of course, this is just an example. And then of course we have um, a couple of others like UK bonds, which are in the UK, but long-term bonds are just global, right? So uh, when we optimize this, we can see we get these numbers. Now, uh, let me just show you on regions. I've put actually put a limit on no, uh, no more than 18% in the UK. So let's say um, we, we raise that to maybe uh, 30%, 30%, and we calculate this, then you can see that it will be, uh, actually it chooses to invest more in the UK right now. Actually, um, apparently it really likes the UK. So let's see what, what happens if we actually put this on 100%, right? So you can see that it goes up to 36%, no more. Uh, let's give it some time to, to find a good solution here. Um, up to 36% in the UK, right? So the combination of these two is uh, 37 already. Okay, now uh, if instead we don't like the UK, let's say I don't want to invest more than 10% in the UK, you will see, of course, that the result of that, we um, don't invest that much in the UK anymore. And of course, the UK is this line and is this line, UK bonds line. Um, you can see that we're we have those effects immediately. Similarly, uh, I've put limits on the sectors, as you can see. Uh, for example, currently we're putting 40% in equities. Uh, there's a limit of 40% there. Uh, it probably wants to invest even more in equities if it hadn't didn't have this constraint. Um, and uh, but for example, for bonds, even if we put a 20% a uh, maximum limit there, it will not affect it, of course, because it only wants to invest 9.7% in bonds at this point in time to maximize that return. So I hope you find this example interesting. And um, if you want to know more about this, take, uh, try it yourself uh, in the OptoPlanner examples. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching this demonstration. If you want to know more about OptoPlanner, just go to the website optoplanner.org. And if you want to try this example yourself, just download the zip, unzip it, and run the examples. Thanks for watching.